Cabernet tends to be the sort of Errol Flynn of the great varieties. One of Australia's leading beer judges. People always ask, how do you get involved in sake and how does that connect to music? Because wine is an adventure. Conventional winemakers who just condemn all natural wine as faulty. The prestigious title of sake samurai. Looking at whiskey in more of an artful culinary way. The difference between getting good quality fresh hops, it just translates straight through into the beer. This is the Drinks Adventures podcast. I'm James Atkinson. And this is the show where I speak to some of the world's most exciting producers of beer, wine and spirits and uncover trends and issues in the drinks industry today. Home to Australia's oldest continuously operating wine region, the Hunter Valley, and exciting new cool climate regions such as Orange, the Southern Highlands and Tumbarumba, New South Wales produces a hugely diverse array of different wine styles. The New South Wales Wine Awards were created in 1996 to build awareness about the quality of the state's wines. Dave Brooks has been Chief Judge of the Awards for the last four years, and he joins us in this episode of the Drinks Adventures podcast. A highly accomplished wine writer and wine judge, Dave was ducks of the Len Evans Tutorial in 2011 and has judged at more than 70 shows globally. The 2020 edition of the New South Wales Wine Awards took place in recent weeks, And it was Dave's final year at the helm. As such, it's an appropriate juncture to meet Dave and find out what he reckons are some of the most exciting wines coming out of New South Wales today and other interesting trends and developments in New South Wales wine. This is a special episode of the Drinks Adventures podcast produced with the support of the New South Wales Wine Industry Association. And I started by asking Dave how New South Wales wine has evolved during his tenure. Obviously, there's the classics that do well every show, and we're talking sort of Hunter Shiraz and Semillon and, and, you know, orange Rieslings and, and Chardonnays and Sparklings. And that, that's like a constant that's gone throughout the show. But we're seeing improvement in a few varieties um, that's really pleasing. Certainly, Pinot, during my tenure as chief judge, has, has got a lot stronger as class. The Rieslings continue to improve. Red blends, like the same, the single red varietals, are just looking fantastic. So I, th- I think we've mentioned it before, you know, they used to be called alternative varieties and now we're kind of con- calling them appropriate varieties because they're sort of suited to our climate and, and our regions. So they're probably the most exciting classes during my time at the show. I think I heard you say that, you know, in the first couple of years that you were chief judge, there were no mm-hmm. gold medals awarded in the Pinot Noir class. Why was that and what sort of changed with those wines and where are they coming from, these top examples of New South Wales Pinot? Orange is leading the, the charge as, as far as the Pinot goes. You do find them popping up in other regions as well, but I think vintage has, has to play a, a huge role in that. We've had a we've hit a bit of a purple patch of, of vintages over the last few years and they're starting to, to creep into the, the wine share system now. So I think the wines come from a stronger um, growing season. And I think, I mean, I'd like to say that people are getting a better handle on um, on their patch of dirt and farming, but, I, you know, I think vintage is probably the strongest factor that comes through that. There's some beautiful wines. Um, and, yeah, the first couple of years of my of my tenure, I, I unfortunately couldn't get a, um, a Pinot Trophy out of, the, out of the entries and as much as I tried and... And um, as much as I was prodded to try and try and find something, um, if the wines weren't there, they're just not there. But the last couple of years, they've been fine. It's all about detail and clarity, really, with Pinots. And I mean, they've got generosity of fruit and they've got all the pinosity, all the, the, the varietal characters that you'd expect. But they're just sort of lacking that detail and clarity that sort of drove them over the line. We're getting strong silver medals and stuff like that, but there was nothing that really stuck out um, and no real gold medal wines. The vintages that you're talking about where these Pinots are really shining, which vintages are those? At the moment, we're sort of getting through the, the 19s are, are coming through into the show system now and they look fantastic. There's some good wines from 18 as well. Um, so yeah, those two vintages, they're really starting to hit their straps. There were some sort of longer drawn out growing seasons instead of the short, sharp, you know, heat burst. So I think there was some nice, even, even ripening and sort of less stressed ferments. And I think that's where the detail comes into the wines. You'd be, they, you'd be getting those beautiful sort of complex characters. And you're also getting the, um, the fineness of structure, um, the natural acidity and also all those beautiful Pinot characters that we love. Now, talking about, as you called them, the appropriate 
varieties. What do you yeah. think are some of the highlights there in terms of um, particular varieties that really shone in your view? Well, over the last couple of years, Malbec's done really well. That's a fantastic variety, sort of crunchy, sort of beautiful drinking in its youth, like straight out of the out of the gates. What else? The Portuguese varieties that are coming through, the, the Tariga and various other Portuguese varieties, and a lot of the Italian varieties as well. It's basically anything that ends with an O. <laughs> um, so those are looking really strong as well. And, of course, those varieties as part um, of a blend with more traditional varieties that we're used to as well. Wines like Mouvet as well um, is looking super strong. It's always fantastic to judge and the callbacks when the, the top wines come up to the table, there's usually a, a huge diversity of style as well, obviously with a whole lot of different varieties in there, which is really exciting and it's, it's, yeah, it's a very cool class to judge. Are those appropriate varieties? I mean, are we talking about like serious age-worthy type wines here or are they sort of, are, are a lot of them more in that kind of, um, you know, young and bright sort of fresh and aromatic kind of styles? Yeah, it's interesting, yeah, because there's those really crunchy sort of slurpy wines that come through, but there's also wines that have some structure and are a lot more serious and a, a lot more fruit um, depth and intensity. So... It's just really cool that we've got such diversity of styles within those um, varieties as well. So, um, sure, you've got your your early drinking sort of um, like lovely sort of bright bouncy wines, but there's also some some wines that will you know more than happily spend some time in the cellar, which is really cool. So it's quite a diverse class. What about Chardonnay? It's obviously a constantly evolving beast in this country. Um, what, what, what's been yeah. the evolution of Chardonnay in the last four years? You know, I think Chardonnay is probably the most improved um, variety in Australia over the last sort of couple of decades. You know, we go from the 90s where they were where it's the big buttery sort of um, sort of Chardonnays and then we swung the needle all the way the other way and went to the super lean sort of struck matchy sulfide wines um, that was super tight and linear and now the needle is sort of swinging back to that midpoint again and it's a variety that's beginning to look really comfortable in its own skin as far as regional characters and nuance in Australia. So the wines are really fine and they just show beautiful clarity and drive and just all those lovely Chardonnay flavours. But there is diversity within that class as well. But we're mainly looking for that clarity, drive and just purity of fruit. And obviously there's been some cracking hunter vintages that, you, that would have come before you in the show. Did mm -hmm. we really see those, you know, 17s, 18s in the reds really, really shining this year? Yeah, we did. I mean, both in, in reds and whites, the hunter's gone through a really strong, um, strong passion over 17s were amazing, you know, uniformly. The, the quality levels were, were fantastic. Um, 18, um, probably a bit more bandwidth in quality. The quality was sort of up and down, but it's still a fantastic vintage. And I think 19 sits somewhere in between those two vintages as far as quality goes as well from the wines that we've, we've seen from that vintage already. But yeah, we've been pretty pretty lucky. I think I've had a pretty pretty good trot during my tenure for quality of wines. Um, I certainly can't complain about that. I think we've had some some fantastic vintages pop up at the show from the hunter. I heard you mention at the masterclass the other week that you saw a few wines coming through in the show that had a bit of smoke taint. How widespread was that? It wasn't widespread at all. Obviously, the 2020 red seven hit the table. Yep. Yeah. In whites, there was a couple of Pinot Gris that showed a little bit of taint, and in the rosé class, there was a few wines that showed a little bit of smoke taint. It might have been a case of people declassifying 2020 red fruit and just putting it into rosé to get it out there. So, unfortunately, we didn't get a rosé trophy this year. In saying that, there's still good wines from difficult vintages. We've seen some pretty solid 2020 wines pop up. So it's not all doom and gloom. It's just, um, it's obviously, it's been a, a very challenging year for, for wine growers, but there's still going to be great wines that, that come out of these difficult vintages. And it's just, um, it's just seeking out those wines and, and yep, they're there. Do you think it's concerning though that, uh, some producers are, you know, are seeing fit to enter those in competitions so that they're possibly not aware that the issue is as prevalent as it is? Yeah, I don't think it's a, it's a huge concern. I 
think there's an economic reality to it as yeah. well. They obviously want to try and sell these wines through. It's like any year, really, you just got to choose wisely. You're always going to find wines that you do or don't like, but there's just a, that additional challenge this year. But it's, in saying that, I, I don't want to sound alarmist, but I think there's some pretty good wines from 2020 out there. So I wouldn't discount buying 2020s on the, on the back of a difficult vintage. Speaking more broadly about New South Wales wine, we often hear that it's not as well supported by people in New South Wales as it should be. Do you think overall that it is a bit underrated in Australia? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I've I've really grown to appreciate New South Wales wine over time, especially Hunter Valley Sauvignon is just like world class. It's pretty hard for people to wrap their heads around when it's young, I guess, because a lot of consumers really struggle with high acid wines, but you know, with a bit of age, it's just absolutely world class. The thing about the reds in, in New South Wales as well is they're medium bodied and more savoury um, in style. And obviously you do get some of the really bright sort of contemporary wines as well. And there's regions that are beginning to really come into their own as well. I mean, orange is just looking better and better each year. I, I look at the wines. Mudgee is like kicking some magic goals as well. The Canberra region is awesome. Tumby Chardonnays are just some of the best in Australia. So, yeah, really cool stuff happening in New South Wales, which is awesome. I think we're beginning to see more and more support for New South Wales, certainly in this state. And people are starting to cotton on interstate as well. And there's no greater champion for New South Wales wines than the OCC, where we, we judge the show as well. Their list is just chock a block full of New South Wales wine, which is awesome. It's just a, a, an awesome show and I've kind of pretty sad to be leaving, to be honest. I've really enjoyed my time and I wish the, the incoming Chief Judge all the best. And yeah, I'll be keeping a close eye on the show in the future, that's for sure. The Drinks Adventures podcast is produced by me, James Atkinson, with additional production and mixing by Dave Robertson. You can find complete transcripts, links and other information on the show at drinksadventures.com.au. You can follow me on all social media platforms at by James Atkinson. Like my Facebook page, James Atkinson Drinks Adventures, to be kept informed of podcast giveaways and other news about the show. The Drinks Adventures podcast needs your support as listeners. Please do us a favour and leave an honest review and rating for the podcast on iTunes or Stitcher. We love hearing your feedback and it helps inform other people this is a show worth listening to. Or simply drop us a line at hello at drinksadventures.com.au.